Uh, good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for uh, remaining here while we were in ex executive session. Uh, as you saw, the committee met today and adopted its operational resolution, and uh, which gave the chair the ability to uh, issue subpoenas. Uh, we discussed in executive session the, the names and the organizations that will be receiving those subpoenas. And I know that the question you all have is, is so who's getting them? And uh, we're not going to tell you. Uh, the reason is, is that I don't, th and I've said this before, I don't think it's fair for people to find out because of your reporting that they're going to receive a subpoena. We'd like to get them served first. And as soon as uh, the subpoenas are served, we're going to make it known who those individuals were and make the actual text of the subpoena available to all of you. There's about 20 subpoenas. Uh, they are between, they're to individuals and organizations. And I'll answer your questions. Can you tell us how many I'll give you a rough breakdown. I think it's about 17 individuals and about three organizations. Okay. Yes, Judge. Can you say anything about uh, where people are located? Is it presumably inside the Port Authority, inside the government office? I don't really want to get too specific. I mean, they're all in New Jersey. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I want to make it clear is that we just want to respect the process and give them an opportunity to be served. Some of them have attorneys and uh, will probably be affecting service by their attorneys who have, some of them have indicated they'll accept service. But we wanted to make sure that they had the opportunity to be served, that they didn't find out about it online or in tomorrow's paper. And so as soon as we have word that they're served, we'll make those names available as we learn that. And uh, the process is going to start as soon as we're done with this uh, press availability, and uh, we hope to have information later tonight or first thing tomorrow is who's served. Michael? Two, two questions. One, could somebody avoid being served by going to Hawaii? Uh, well, we're not going to send the process server to Hawaii, but I'm sure they're going to come back at some point in time. Uh, will some of these 17 be surprised that they're served? I don't think so. John, can you, Brian. Uh, can you elaborate? When you talk about sending subpoenas to 17, Obviously, you're going to be looking for some documentation from these people, as you already did with David Wildstein and, and uh, I guess, Bill Trump. Uh, can you break down for us how many of them you would expect to see uh, in this room or some similar committee room over the coming weeks? Great point. What kind of timetable you'd like to see on that? Uh, can you give, just give us a little fill in on that? Yeah, well, let me be clear. What we're asking for first is material and documents before we ask for testimony. Uh, what we've done in the process in the past, and, and I think it's worked pretty well, is let's get the material that's relevant that will inform our questions for the individuals who we may ultimately want to bring in here. Uh, 20 sounds like a large number. It is entirely possible that on some of those subpoenas, uh, the material will come back and there'll be absolutely no reason to go any further or ask any more questions. It's a fair process to ask for the documents first and not bring them in here to ask um, questions perhaps without any foundation. This gives us an ability to narrow the scope as we have and to continue to move forward at the same time. Angie? Can you extend the date range? I know the original batch asked for uh, documents between August 1st and mid-December. The date range has been expanded, and when we make the copy of the subpoena available, we'll get that to you. When it comes to the dates, you oh. just said the assembly floor, the Christie administration was trying to run out the clock on prior subpoenas. Um, Port Authority was trying to run out the Port clock. Authority. Yeah. Nothing. Could you elaborate on that? Who was trying to run out the clock? Yeah. Well, we had we had we had asked for documents from the Port Authority. Uh, when we initially did it, we did it just as a normal Freedom of Information Act request. Those were not responded to. We issued subpoenas. Uh, those subpoenas were not completely answered. Uh, it was curiously right about you know two or three months before the authorization for the committee would expire. So then we reauthorized the committee. But clearly there was, at least it appeared to us, that there was an intent to just delay and, and, and negotiate and uh, quibble about what could be provided and why we were asking for it until the clock ran out. And obviously, even with a two-year mandate, as this committee has, that's always a danger. We don't know how long this process will take. You know, One of my colleagues on the floor said that this should be concluded I think he used 90 days as, as a time frame. Uh, if that were possible, that'd be great. 
Uh, it's also entirely possible we could get to the end of two years and not have all the answers. I just don't know. And so we're going to follow this wherever it goes and take it step by step. Yes. Sharon, what is it, that number you mentioned, 20 is a lot, 70 individuals. What does that suggest, if anything, about how broadly you think this was known about, discussed, planned? Well, there, the, we've got a body of documents we're looking at, we've been looking at, several thousand pages, and that has informed our decision making on where to look and who to ask questions of. Um, we want to make sure that we are asking all of the right questions to all of the right people for the right documents. As I said, uh, we are now looking at the possibilities. And so we've seen information that would lead us to believe that we should ask somebody for documents. It's entirely conceivable we get those documents and there's absolutely nothing in them. Uh, the inquiry for that person will probably go no further. But we would be remiss if we just didn't ask for those documents at that point in time. Yes. The, uh, let's start with the last one. Uh, it's probably about a 10 day return period or maybe a little bit longer. I think the, the date is going to be early February when they're supposed to return once they're served. They're gonna have, I think, two weeks to respond. So I think it's gonna be early February when they're supposed to respond. Uh, the process was to look at all of the information we had and all of the information we have has raised questions about a number of people that we've identified as to what they knew and, and what their connection was. Some of it is seemingly random. We see names um, that were provided in response to requests for documents that asked for information about the George Washington Bridge. And so we get communications that we have names in. We'd like to understand why those names were provided. We tried to get those questions answered with Mr. Wildstein. He took the fifth and we weren't able to pursue it that way. So in one respect, it's an opportunity for us to get answers to questions we couldn't have gotten otherwise. But what we're really looking at is the why. I mean, we have a, we know who sent out the uh, request to close those lanes. Uh, we know who received it. We don't know why it was sent. Uh, we don't know who gave that person authorization to send it. We don't know why she felt empowered to send it. Uh, the tenor of the conversation that is in the, and th that one email communication implies that there had to be other conversations before so that both sides knew what was going on. And so then you see other names in the chain and you can start to raise questions about what did they know and were they involved in some way. Is everyone on the committee aware of this? When we met in executive session, all members of the committee were made aware of all of the names and uh, I believe that there was consensus among all the committee members uh, that they were in agreement that there was an appropriate reason to issue the subpoenas to all the named individuals or organizations. Do you receive yes. subpoenas? Uh, how concerned were you by the inclusion of uh, the government's press secretary, Mark Brunias, in the original set of documents? And is that something that concerns you enough that you're going to pursue that? Well, look, I think that we're concerned just overall at what took place, that something like this was issued by somebody who worked for the governor in a, in a rel relatively senior position, and so we need to get to the bottom of it. So I, I can't tell you that one person is more concerning than another. I think they're all concerning, and the fact that it happened is concerning. Do you think uh, there were some comments made by yourself, by other members of the committee, members of the legislature over the weekend and last week on television. Is it, we can assume, though, right, that Bridget Kelly and Bill Stepien given that they were the centerpiece of the governor's actions last week, that they are on this list of 17 people. Can you confirm those two names? I'm not going to confirm any names right now, Josh. John, are you, Steve. Uh, do, you see, uh, do you foresee any members of the legislature getting subpoenas at any point? I think that we're way ahead of ourselves there, and I don't want to speculate on, uh, on that topic. I mean, I think there's a couple of constitutional questions that come to play in, in answering that question, but right now we're focusing on the information we have and following those leads. Yes, David. Are you concerned about the possibility that you're going to call witnesses that are going to come in here, take the fifth, you're not going to get information, you're going to find them in contempt. Can you talk a little bit about how much teeth this committee has and what it needs to have happen, I guess, from the Mercer County prosecutor? Is that the way it works, where there would be some sort of a punishment for not answering questions? Because this could drag on for months where people just won't say a word. I understand the question. I guess I don't want to start the process off now that we have a new committee by talking about punishment. 
Uh, I think we've got a very good process. Uh, the Assembly Committee is invested with the power to issue subpoenas. There's an expectation that people who receive those subpoenas will comply with them. Uh, we have no reason to believe they won't. The governor made a statement that he will cooperate with all appropriate investigations. We're certainly an appropriate investigation. And so I'm not going to start speculating on what will happen if we don't get the information we need. Let me see if we get the information we need first, and then we'll discuss that issue later on. Uh, Matt. This uh, two dual thing, you know, why not have just let Senator Weinberg involved, get, let, let her get involved by forming a joint committee she's been on this since September? Um, wouldn't that have been easier, and are you concerned about duplicating that? I don't think there's duplicative efforts. I mean, you've got two different houses, both with constitutional authority to inquire into this, and this house has been looking into it. Uh, for almost two years now, and we've gotten to this point, and this House is going to continue to do that work. The Senate is certainly entitled to conduct their own investigation. I've worked up until this point. Uh, Senator Weinberg has essentially been an unofficial member of the Transportation Committee as we've gone through this process. Now she'll head up a panel in the Senate. Uh, I expect that both uh, panels in the Senate and the Assembly will work cooperatively and share information. And so I don't think there's any danger of duplication of effort, and perhaps it, it might make it a more thorough investigation. Angie? Well, have you been in progress on the redactions in the original Not yet. I know counsel is reaching out to uh, Mr. Wildstein's counsel this afternoon uh, to get conclusion to that. But it's, uh, it's gone on longer than I'd like, and, and next time the committee meets, if we don't have an answer, we'll have to discuss what remedies may be available to us to get to the bottom of that. Uh, yes. Do you feel like you have the authority to subpoena the government? Well, you know, that question gets asked all the time, and there's no intention right now to subpoena the governor. Well, you know, see, the problem with that question is when I answer that question, the, the entire context is not going to be reported, and I understand it. So all I want to say is, I know, I know, but I understand how this works, too. That's not, that's not what we're doing. Right now, we're, su we're going to issue subpoenas to individuals and organizations that we've seen in the documents that are relevant to our inquiry. Uh, we've seen nothing in the documents that has the governor, you know, an email from the governor or to the governor. We've not seen any kind of direct link. And so to even speculate really takes this investigation and, you know, uh, takes it into an area that I don't want to go to right now. We're going to follow the leads we have. And when we have leads that are relevant, we'll follow them. We don't have any that take us in that direction right now. Uh, 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 there's a I don't have any reason to believe that the four members who are assigned to this committee will be obstructionists. Uh, we talked in executive session about the subpoenas. There was consensus among the subpoenas. They understood why they were necessary to be issued. And look, the charge about partisanship has been a charge that has been part of this process from day one. Uh, when the initial resolutions were adopted in the last session, there were charges of partisanship. But I want to make it clear. Uh, I didn't want to be in the governor's office looking at who sent emails. The emails that we got because we were looking at the Port Authority led us there. And so it would be really a dereliction of our responsibility if now that we know that somebody in the governor's office sent an email to close lanes from Fort Lee to the George Washington Bridge and we walk away from it because somebody says, well, that would be partisan. It wouldn't be doing our job. It would be negligent. John, does uh, Bridge have counsel? Um, I believe, you know what, I'm not positive, uh, but I know a number of people that have been discussed. Uh, today, we received word that they have counsel. I just don't want to misstate it, but uh, several people have retained counsel today. Assemblyman, you, there were several concerns expressed today about having two separate committees, having two separate sure. councils for these committees, the cost of all of this. What can you, are you concerned about the cost of this to protect the taxpayers and possibly concerned about this dragging on and on and on? Well, I don't know that it'll drag on and on and on. We don't know how long it'll take. Um, we could get answers to these subpoenas and very quickly have resolution to the questions we have. We could have people fight us on these subpoenas and fight us in testimony, and it could take longer. But the question is, is what's the price of truth? 
We, we've seen, we've got evidence that the power invested at least in one person in the governor's office was abused and used for improper purposes. Uh, we don't know why that person issued the order she did, and we don't know why the person who received it seemed to willingly take that order, but we know it was wrong, and we know it shouldn't happen again. And so the question that, you know, we, we've heard a lot of talk today about, well, what's this going to cost? And, you know, the implication is, is that, well, if it costs too much, we shouldn't do it. Uh, I think we need to get to the bottom of it because it's not just about who closed the lanes. It's about people who believe they shouldn't trust government to begin with are now being given a very concrete reason why they shouldn't. We need to assure them that we're going to fix it so that they can trust government. One more question. Yes, sir. Um, presumably, uh, your committee and the Senate committee will be at the same people and documents. If you're asking for the same kinds of materials, how will you negotiate who gets to see one? Well, we haven't gotten there yet, uh, but there's a commitment that both the Assembly Committee and the Senate Committee will work cooperatively. And so as we move forward in this process, we'll get documents, we'll have discussions about those documents. I mean, I think the real thorny issue that you raise is about testimony, and we can certainly have that discussion as well. But again, we're, you know, we're early in that stage. We'll cross that bridge when we get to it, and we'll make sure that we're trying to maximize the effect of this investigation by working cooperatively. When do you think the committee will next meet? Well, we're not going to get answers to our subpoenas probably until early February. It'll take some time to digest the documents. Uh, 20 subpoenas will probably produce quite a lot of paper. So I can't imagine the committee meeting before the middle of February, but that could change. Things could develop that require us to come back in, and obviously uh, you'll all get notice uh, when we send those meeting notices out. Thank you all very much.